All right. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the Global Lacrosse Summit. I'm Stephen Stamp, glad to be here. Um, and to have Christian Del Bianco. I'm sure everyone is, uh, is quite excited to hear his talk about developing youth goalies. And uh, Christian, welcome to, the, uh, welcome to the Global Lacrosse Summit. No, awesome. It's uh, obviously a very exciting thing, a pretty uh, good format to have, especially in the crazy times we're living in at the moment. So I think the big thing, right, is just hearing other lacrosse minds and kind of everyone giving their opinions. And it's something that is a game that I think we lacked in previous years. And if you look where everything's evolving with social media and everything that way, it's really a way to reach out to different markets and grow the game. Absolutely. And the, uh, the beauty of it, I mean, there are some good things coming out of this this time, these weird times. And one of them is that, uh, I mean, all kudos to Brad for Brad MacArthur for figuring this out and coming up with this idea and making it happen. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a one-off. I think the idea is to have things keep happening. Maybe not 50 speakers over two weeks yeah. like we're doing in this stretch. That's uh, pretty ambitious. But, uh, yeah, we're going to have some uh, – we're definitely going to have folks uh, – keep we're going to keep doing this so christian do you know do you have we didn't get a chance to chat before because of the tech issues but do you have a, a presentation like a, a so, powerpoint or are you just not, nothing really powerpoint based i'm not really too much of a tech guy i have a couple pages of notes here so i'll try not to ramble on too much and go down the wormhole but just for anybody if you have questions just put them in the chat right i mean i think one thing that especially throughout coaching younger kids I've learned is I can say something and maybe with my knowledge and the way I learn, it makes perfectly good sense. But for somebody else, they can kind of be looking at you like you're talking crazy. You're talking a different language, right? So as coaches in general, I think we're all kind of aware that just don't be afraid to ask questions. I'll elaborate and try to better explain the points I'm trying to get across. Perfect. So, I mean, if I'm going to start, I'll just kind of say something. A little about me personally and my lacrosse development growing up. I think for a lot of goalies out there, we kind of, we grow up and it's kind of the forgotten position, right? I think coaches, they kind of leave it off to the side because they don't know too much about it. They won't want to say the wrong things and it's kind of that weird area, right? So I think for me personally, I was obviously, I'm not a big guy, so I wasn't necessarily the most conventional growing up. And I think that that lack of guidance kind of left you in the net and it was kind of go figure it out, right? So fortunate enough that I grew up playing in Coquitlam, pretty good minor program, obviously was fortunate enough to play in the junior program there for six years or five years. And kind of think that was a big step where for me personally in my game, you start thinking more on the mental side of things, you start preparing and you really start thinking, hey, maybe this is something that I can do at the next level, right? And I think through some of those junior years, you started to deal with the pressure, all that stuff, and almost anxiety that can come with the position, right? That a lot of people try to kind of not talk about once again, right? That yes, you're kind of in there alone at some points, and yeah, you're the hero when everything goes right, but you're also the guy that loses the games in some situations, and that's kind of, goalies were weirdos, and that's part of it, right? So I think today, that's kind of, that's a point that I want to hammer down. We're going to kind of cover it in three sections where the first section is just your, your basic youth development at the young age, starting with the novice peewee kind of thing, and then kind of pull into a bracket of peewee bantam midget and some of the mistakes that coaches can make. And then obviously to the junior level where you're really trying to make a push to get to that next stage of your career for some guys, right? Christian, can I just ask quickly what, uh, how you first got into net? Because it's, like you said, you're not the most traditional, you're not the biggest guy. So how did you first start playing and how do you think most kids wind up between the pipes? So for me, I'm not really the most conventional story once again. So I was, I think, tyke and I was just, for lack of a better term, I was a terrible kid. My dad just would, I'd signed up for lacrosse and I was kind of kicking and screaming. I wouldn't want to go. My older brother had just started playing goalie. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go play and I'll stop complaining, but I want to be the goalie. So in Tyke, there's no set goalie. So my poor dad would be showing up 45 to an hour minute, 45 minutes to an hour before tight games, just so I could be the first one there to play goalie and I wouldn't complain. And then obviously through there, my brother also played his whole minor lacrosse in Coquitlam. He's even smaller than I am. So he kind of dealt with that too growing up and we were kind of in it. Obviously there was the 
bit of a brotherly rivalry. You're kind of always comparing who made what team and this and that. So it was fun, right? And I think for most guys, you kind of, you just get thrown into it, right? There's a lot of people, I think, that you see, they don't have a goalie, so they go find the big kid or they just, they need somebody. It's kind of the kid who's just the willing guy that ends up in net, right? So like I said, we're, we're a byproduct of our environment with goalies and it's, it's often not really a coincidence that we come a little weird. So, I mean, I guess we can kind of start off with early development here. So the big thing that I think is like, it's, it's really forgotten is you're putting a kid in a new situation, right? So I, I don't know a lot of people, maybe goalies that are listening to this, a lot of people, maybe coaches, right? And I think the biggest thing, even for a guy who's in the NLL, guys, as we get older, if you go like, say, four months without being in gear for some reason, and you go back into gear, it's stiff, it's awkward, right? And you're kind of, you're putting these young kids in this situation and they kind of, they go out there, you all have seen it, I'm sure, where they almost look like a piece of plywood, right? They're going out there, they can barely hold their stick, which is something I'll talk about today, which is, is one of the hardest parts, especially with the novice age group, right? And I think the big thing is just keep things simple, right? Really build up their confidence, right? I mean, kind of something that I always do is I get them to run around. I mean, at a young age, stretching isn't crazy important, but it's almost you want to do stuff, get them falling over, right? Get them comfortable moving around in the equipment and kind of make, make jokes about it and keep them comfortable is something that I've found personally that really helps you start up. Um, the other things like fundamentals, stance, all that, I think the big thing is people will kind of, they try to perfect it, perfect it too soon, right? So for something that I kind of always look at is I, I break it down into different stages, right? So a big thing that you always start with is, you know, you get their stick in their hands. You know what? I think, I, I don't want to say that it's not good, but I think a big mistake that people can make is they use the mini wall and it just, it naturally won't sit that flat for you young kids I find so the best thing is you get the traditional spoon just like we all use in then allow kind of find a tape mark not too high not too low get them comfortable right I think it's hard when you're in bigger groups but it's something that say you have a group of goalies that you're coaching and you see somebody who's kind of struggling you go reach out to their dad or their mom right and just kind of explain what they can do and then from there it makes things easier once they come back next session they have it taped right and they kind of went home and worked on it themselves. Um, Chris, when you say to find a tape mark, you're saying find the spot that's comfortable for them and put some yeah. tape there to make it clear where to have their hands? Exactly. And then it's, we're, once again, boys, we're kind of creatures of habit, right? So once we've established that, every time he goes to get set up, right, he can look, he can find that spot and then start from there, right? Where sometimes I think when you're in your second or third time being in the gear, it's very hard to kind of figure out what's natural, what feels good and get comfortable. So it's kind of just removing one less variable for them and you can move on from there. For stance, I think a big thing, right, especially with the younger kids, if they're, they're a smaller kid, if they're very stretched out, like their legs are very wide because the stick's a little too big for them. Like, I don't know if most people, if you spread your legs, you aren't, you aren't moving very much, right? So I think the big thing is, always preach to keep your knees approximately shoulder width apart. And I think at a young age, it's, it's very hammer fundamentals, hammer fundamentals, right? Cause that's what you're setting them up for PUE midget moving on. Right. I think we've all kind of, a lot of the goalie coaches out there and a lot of guys that I've talked to Nick Rose, Wardo, all these guys who do a lot in the development side of things have said, like, if you get a kid in midget and he's a technical mess for lack of a better term, it's very hard to change, right? Because he has two or three years, four years of bad habits under his belt that you then in terms have to try to break. Um, from other stuff on stance, it, it, it's pretty straightforward, right? You want to always keep their shoulders up, keep them square. A big point that I always hammer out to kids is your chest guard's your biggest piece of equipment, right? So if I'm bent over, if I'm turned to the side, I'm not as wide, right? So I think Marty O'Neill is a great guy who uses this term that you almost want to have like a two by four or a sheet of plywood across your chest and that's your board. And that board also is going to control where you deflect your rebounds and stuff like that. So 
the big thing that if I think a trend in all these points is it's almost like we're setting up training wheels. It's like riding a bike, right? You don't kind of throw a kid out there on a bike, let him fall five times. And then now he doesn't want to go ride the bike ever. Right. So you got to give them tools, do stuff. A big thing, even with young kids is you can use tennis balls. You can intentionally hit them, right? You kind of, you, you err on that side of being over positive and, and make it fun for them. Right. Cause I think when stuff's fun, when kids are enjoying it, they're a lot more likely to A, continue playing the position and B, put the time in to start excelling at the position. And then I think most people, as we know, like when you're good at something, you tend to enjoy it a lot better than when you're not good at something, right? So it's kind of that chain fall effect where you build these fundamentals, they, they start enjoying it, they start exceeding, and then it just kind of, they take it on their own as they get older. Christian, when you have kids, you talked about, you know, obviously being square, having the, the chest up, having, you know, the alignment so you're not turning sideways. If a kid tends to, tends to do that, you're trying to tell him that, but it, he tends to, to do it. How do you actually get them? How do you train them to do that? I think, I think Marty actually has done it with a real two by four. He has. He has done that. And one thing I kind of always did, because I don't have, I don't bring the sheet of plywood, whatever with me, yeah. but... I find I'll even, I'll stick a stick under their arms, under both arms. So they drop their stick, right? They don't have their stick anymore, but it keeps it. So they're almost like this with their hands stuck just in front of their body and square, right? Mm -hmm. And that keeps them flat. And even a point to build off that, especially as kids get older, is if you look at NLL guys, like we don't have a closed hand, right? Like every little bit of surface area that you can build up, like we're spreading our hands, as much space as you can take up, there's obviously benefits. So if you set kids up to understand this at a young age, rather than dealing with a kid at the bantam age that kind of has his arm, common problem, tucked to his side, they're out, they're square, and it makes things a lot easier as you try to progress to a lot more advanced things in the game. Um, so, I mean, I, once again, like I said, feel free to throw questions in for anything on the development side of things for young guys. I think the only last point, like it's three very simple points that I focus on. It's stance, stepping to the ball, right? We want them to attack the ball. So the big thing that I always use an example is we want to get as much volume, right? So say a shot's going stick side high, rather than just sticking out one limb, I'm stepping and bringing the entire center of my body in front of the net, in front of the ball, because that in terms is going to create a better chance of us, A, controlling our rebounds, and if our arm misses, our chest, our legs, everything's still underneath it to increase the percentages. So a big way I kind of say this to kids is you don't want the ball to hit you. You want to hit the ball, right? So as a young kid, they can kind of see that. They understand that. And you almost you get these kids like, yeah, it's, at, at times it can be a little much. And they're kind of trying to punch at the ball and all that. But once you build that confidence up and you get them moving, it's a lot easier to start honing it down to a more controlled movement. Um, for five step arc, super simple concept that I think most people understand in sports in general, but at a young age, it's kind of, they can get lost, especially as we get them out. I think a big mistake that non goalies can make on it is they'll get this kid to come crazy far out, right? Which for older guys, once you're bigger, you're tall, like if you watch Dylan Ward, one of the best in the game, he plays on the top of his crease, right? But Dylan Ward's also 6'5", and he can close the gap to his back post in one step, right? So if you get these little kids all the way out, you're almost you're just putting them out in an ocean. They're more likely to get lost. So a big point that I always kind of say is always we want to step up on a 45-degree angle. One way that I've always taught it is they can look at the blue line or the restraining line, and that's what they want to be pointed to on, say, the left side. Then you step to your top dead center. Then they can use the other net or the center dot to locate themselves. And then they can go to the second blue line or straining line and then back down to their post, right? So obviously we want to crazy preach that tapping your post, locate your net with your hands, your feet, all of that. But I think you're giving them those second tools of markers on the floor. So if they do get lost, they can kind of locate themselves within reason. Um, <laughs> question is coming through I, ha I have one I'm actually curious if you use strings or ropes at all we had uh, Rachel Valarelli on talking about uh, women's field goalie but she used something that actually you can use in all 
all different um, disciplines where she would have, she had her father for a demonstration. They tied ropes, one rope to each post, and he went and stood, you know, at the, at the 12 meter line for that. But you could do the restraining line or just out in front. Do you do that at all with, with kids? Yeah, I, so I don't use anything string related, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fan of that idea. Yeah. But a big thing that I've always kind of done is I'll get the kids to stand up on the floor and I get them to go where the shooter will go. And then I go in net and I show them the differences, right? Like, so even in no equipment, like if I'm standing up on my 45 degree angle, the kids aren't going to see much, right? Mm -hmm. Where if I tuck my butt in the net and kind of play so safe, they all of a sudden see that entire far side. And the more that they start to understand that principle, they can start to understand, okay, if the player is here, this is what he's going to see. This is what I need to try to take away, which right. moving forward is obviously giving them that understanding. At, at a young age, it's hard, right? Because so much of it's basics and just kind of keeping them focused. But definitely as you get to the PUE, Bantam midget age, it starts to develop to a more important thing. We've got a couple of other questions. One is... Uh... If you're if you have a young guy starting a net, how do you teach teach them to be mobile? Because the equipment is pretty bulky, as you mentioned. The gear feels pretty big, and you're trying to get them to step out to move sideways and that. How do you teach them to to get around without it being a problem? Yeah, so a big thing, right? That I was kind of saying, like it's almost like sometimes it can't it can't always be something in the net, right? And I think especially if you're coaching big groups of goalies, you say you're only having three nets, you have eight kids or something, so you can get them. I'm a big thing that uh, Ryan Williams was one of the first people who talked to me about this one is you can just get them up on their straining line, almost make it a circuit thing and just get them stepping over the white line side to side. Right. And once again, if, if you have the coaches, if you have a dad out there, you can kind of get them up there, encouraging it, like making fun of them. Right. Keep it fun, but just getting them to move side by side. It doesn't need to be controlled at the start, but it just getting them loose in that equipment because especially at the start, you, you see kids and they're kind of looking at you like, get me out of this now. So the more fun you can make it, the more you can get them running around. Even if you play at the end, like a sharks and meadow type thing, get them moving. It'll kind of make things easier. So when they do something more controlled, it seems easy because they've been running around, they've been throwing stuff like that, doing all the other little stuff. We have another, uh, another question from Robin Eno saying, uh, I'm an intermediate and started in second year midget, so still learning a lot. Uh, so obviously, just a couple of just a few years in. Uh, do you do you recommend baiting the ball or facing it head on? Because I've seen both tactics, but can't figure out which is best. I would say always like so. This is one thing, right? Where it's hard for me to preach because I say like I I own it. I'm not the most conventional guy, right? I think the game a lot. I do a lot of different things with my stance sometimes and kind of change up my angles. But I would say always err on the side of being conservative, especially from a coaching standpoint. Like personally, when I watch my game, I don't like my game as much as say as a Vino, a Matt Vince, right? So if you watch him play, right, he's very back. He's always square to the ball. Guys like Nick Rose that are like their fundamentals are so sound, right? Like I think you always want to try to square yourself up. And then once you're squared up, then you can rely on your speed second. So do you, are you saying you feel like you put too much emphasis on your speed? I mean, you obviously you do fine, but yeah. uh, you're always, I know you're, you're always trying to improve. Do you feel I like would that? Say, I would honestly say as I get older and as I work on my game more, I think I am getting on a more conservative side of things, understanding that, hey, if I charge out as not a tall guy, I'm opening up the top corner, stuff like that, and just trying to avoid the dipping, right, all that stuff, so... I think for anybody in our position, right, like it's not, it's not a exact science, right? If you look at a guy like Nick Rose and you look at a guy like me, it's our game's a lot different, right? If you look at a guy like Dylan Ward and a guy like me, our game's a lot different, right? It doesn't mean one's better than the other, but it just means that we're different and there's different ways that we would need to be coached to exceed. So at a young age, Young age, we're very fundamental, right? Novice, PUE, all that. We want to really preach the fundamentals. But as you get to, say, the Bantam midget age group, I'm not going to coach a guy who's 6'4", 220 pounds like I would coach myself, right? It's a completely different game. If he moves like I move, he's going to be gassed. And if he sits back in his net, he's not taking advantage of the fact that he's 
a massive frame that he can challenge without guys putting the ball over him. So I think a lot of it you have to, as you get older, start catering to their game. And a big mistake that I think from guys that coached me every once in a while when I was a kid that say were a goalie is they would want me to be what they were, right? We make the mistake that because we know our way of saving the ball, we try to make everyone like us, right? Where it's okay that other things work for different goalies, right? So we kind of, we have to find that fine line of encouraging them to be individual and have their own success and still being fundamentally sound. Excellent. Uh, we have a, I think, a pretty interesting question here. Do you have any tips to teach kids who are new to goalie not to turn their heads away from the play? Uh, so one thing that I, so you're saying just tracking, right? Kind of focus uh, point? I think so, yeah. Focus. I was, when I first read it, I actually was thinking not like turning flinching. your head away from shots. Yeah. yeah, flinching. So one thing I always kind of, once again, on that kind of that simplified training, training wheel theory is at a young age, it's a little harder, but kind of write down three points for them to focus on. And this is something that even I do in my game. Say I'm like there's a four goal run or something and I'm kind of fighting it a bit. It's kind of you simplify things, right? So say write three points, even if you write them on like a little piece of their head on tape or something and just say see ball, step to ball, reset, right? So every time they kind of get a little lost or their little head in the clouds, just see ball, track ball. And I think the big thing that I found is every kid's different on this, but for some kids, like you have to have them make sure they're watching in the other end, right? When the offense is in the other end, watching the ball there and there, right? And especially I think if you're coaching with association, I had, I was working with two Langley kids, a great set of brothers. Um, and sometimes they were a pretty powerhouse team and they would go 10 minutes or 12 minutes without getting a shot, right? And then someone would come down and they'd have that odd shot and they'd let in a squeaker, right? Because it's kind of hard to find a groove. And it's almost easier when you're getting peppered by 10 shots than one shot every three minutes. So I think the big thing is you got to be very disciplined on that, tracking the ball the whole time. Even if it's in the other end, our end, whatever, make sure that they're always ready. Say that the ball crosses center make sure they're in their stance, right? And as a coach, you can be yelling at them, right? So say the ball crosses center, they're in their stance, they're tracking right away. Don't let them wait for, yeah, there's probably not going to be a shot from center, but don't let them wait till last second because those are bad habits that, once again, if you set at a young age, it's just going to get worse and worse and snowball as you get older. What about the flinching, if that was in case that was what you meant? Yeah. For flinching, like I said, like a big thing is the confidence side of things. And especially this is something that I, I learned in field lacrosse to pull over to the box game with young kids is tennis balls are not a bad thing to use. I'm not saying use them in a practice because obviously it affects your shooter's ability to shoot the ball the same way. But if you're working one-on-one -on -one with the kid, right, kind of pepper them with some tennis balls because you, you know what I mean? You kind of, you wire some full speed with a tennis ball. It hits them and they start kind of understanding that, Hey, you know what? These are pretty good pads I have on. It's not going to hurt me, right? So it's, once again, that whole theory of training wheels where if you kind of set them up, you build the confidence, you get them feeling good, then when you have a kid doing a three-step crow hop, they're not going to shrink. And as a goalie, as we all know, if, if you're getting smaller, you're flinching, your chances are going down drastically. Yeah. We may never let you get back to your, your own notes because uh, we have another uh, that's question. Fine. Yeah, I, see, I like this, and I – I was kind of joking around with some people. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to talk to yourself for 30 minutes or 40 minutes, right? And not get stuck down. Yeah. Room. So it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I had to uh, call off the previous session because uh, Jeff Shatler wasn't feeling well. He's going to be fine. But uh, I just wanted to feel well. So we have to do it later. And I had to go. And so there was nobody. There wasn't even like the two of us interacting. Yeah. It was just me saying, hey, everybody, here's what's happening. It's so weird to have yeah. no. Like on a dance floor, right? You kind of you get stuck. Yeah. There and just like. <laughs> As we're talking about making oh, good stuff, right? Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, but a uh, follow-up to the mobility question is, how do you progressively teach goalies to pass the ball? Because uh, it's hard in novice, but you don't want to ignore it then. But the expectations you have to manage too. A hundred percent, right? And I, I've seen kids, like I worked with two peewee kids last year, that they were throwing three-quarters of the floor, right? 
And I think the biggest thing that people, kids are very simple, right? So if a kid's not good at throwing, do you think he's going to go home and practice throwing? Probably not, right? At a young age, you kind of, you try to avoid things that you're not good at because it makes you uncomfortable. It's not as great, right? You'll kind of, you'll do the little flip pass to the guy in the crease. And at a young age, obviously mm -hmm. there's situations and games where you need to do that. But I think we got to really encourage them in practices to practice, 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 right? It's the same fundamentals as if you're teaching a passing like out of a player, right? Always make sure they're stepping. Make sure I think a big thing is when teams break out at young age, young kids, they get so excited, they start sprinting down the floor, right? And for the goalie, he's worried that he can't throw that far. So he kind of rushes it up and throws it off his back foot. It flies off the end boards, changes the possession, right? So I think the big thing is just really preach for them to take their time, practice fundamentals, make sure their outlet passes aren't running further than they can actually f throw, right? And then as they get better, they can start doing it more on their own, right? You can start starting your practices with outlet passes, right? Say you're going two sides down the floor, make them practice their passing, right? Even if the start, it's ugly and it kind of slows down your practice, it's something that I think you got to invest your time in because long term, like for a guy like me, guys like Wardo, Rosie, all of us kind of the game's evolving and you want to be able to do that thread and kind of keep teams honest in transition. Yeah. I mean, you see things like, I mean, the big you hitting a bunch of guys, one team will be coming off the bench. You see Wardo to Joey Capito, yeah. Nick Rose and Scott Dominey this year. <laughs> They're just already really clicking. It's, it's great to develop that. I'm curious, like, I like the point you made about guys aren't going to generally practice what they're not good at. So if, and, and then if you, if they're not good at throwing or passing and then you put them in a situation where you're running a drill and everyone's watching and, or in a yeah. game, it just amps the pressure up. So uh, yeah, I like the idea of just have the goalies. If you've got two, especially let them just play catch. Nobody else even has to be watching. And if the throws and, go into the stands, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Ball. And I think keep it fun. And I think, a big thing, like just from personal experience, uh, I think goalie parents are very committed, right? So I think if you, if you go talk to a goalie's parents and say, hey, you know what, take him to a field and it's just you and him and go throw the ball around, right? Even though there's no equipment on, you get him used to the big stick, right? He starts building the confidence up and that's something that they can do away from practice, right? And then come to practice and it's a lot easier. And then you're not wasting time of your drills. I know Sometimes it can be limited and it can be hard to find times to work with your goalie. So if you do stuff like that, that the parents can work on themselves, you're just, you're getting yourself ahead of the curve. We've got one question that's uh, is kind of leaping ahead a bit from uh, the early developmental stages, asking about the junior or senior level, which isn't our prime focus in this one, but, but still, it's okay. Um, asking how much input the goalie should have in implementing penalty kill schemes, like how much should the uh, should the goalie have to say about how things are running? This is this is a good one, right? All of it, right? Me, me and Pat Coyle and Junior, we used to have it where I would just there's certain things. I, I I'm a guy who I like to sit sit in the back of my net, right? And I like to be kind of aggressive, attack the ball, a lot of movement. And he basically told me that this is how we're playing it, and you have to stand on the top of your crease, right? And for the first three games, I was looking at him like you're nuts. Like I'm getting scored on, like I'm so bitter at him for it. Right. Like, and kind of, I think the big thing, right. Is coaches always should listen to their goalies, but I think as goalies, we got to kind of buy into the bigger scheme. Right. And once again, kind of on the airing side of, because I wasn't comfortable challenging out like that, I was kind of just like, no, I don't want to do it. That's not how I have my success. Right. But then I understand it's for a bigger thing and schemes. And as a goalie, the more you develop to change that up, I think we found with shooters, right? I came from sitting back in the manette to all of a sudden I was on the top of my crease during PK and guys were kind of looking at you like, wait, like, no, no, this isn't the goalie that we played four times a year in junior, right? So I think a big thing with this, the only point that I'd say at a younger age is a common mistake is coaches will send the young kid down with the offense while the offense runs power play, right? And then you bring the goalie back and he has no idea what the defense is doing because he was getting shots with the power play the whole time. And I know it's hard to practice your power play without a goalie sometimes for young kids because they got to be kept interesting. 
or interested, sorry. But if you just throw the goalie in the defense at a young age and then he doesn't understand, oh, they're sliding from here, you're not really doing him any favors. Cool. Uh, another question is uh, if do you use a drop step going post to post? And I would add, how, you know, is that another thing that's going to be different for different goalies? I, I think once again, it's on how far out you are, how tall you are, right? Like, what's, what's your movement ability? I kind of, what I always preach at a young age is you should never go further out on, say I'm at a shot top left. I should never be further out that I can't reach the back post with say my stick or my right leg in one big step, right? So I think at a young age, it's a lot harder because your footwork isn't as fast. But I think a big thing is you can almost do the push slide step where you change directions, you lead, and then you slide up and kind of drag that back leg to get where you need to. So once again, it, it's, it's very dependent on who you're working with specifically. But a big thing I would always kind of say is you can find someone who's at a similar mobility level or a similar guy to kind of look to. So for, for me as a kid, a guy who I'm actually playing with now was a guy who as a kid I watched because he wasn't a crazy big guy. He was having a ton of success in Washington and Tyler Richards, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you see what they do and how they have success. And then you can kind of implement that into your game and experiment. I think we're ready to let you get back to your, uh, anything you wanted to address yeah. at this point. Sweet. So kind of just, we'll, we'll build on to the next stage of kind of the older guys and kind of moving on and me mental side of the game. So I think we've already touched practice passing all that. Um, I think on the side of parents, okay, so, and coaches, this is for everyone. I think body language is a super important thing in games, right? Like we were saying, there's a lot of pressure in our position. So say this was something my dad was terrible for. He was the loudest guy in the stands growing up, and he's definitely mellowed as we uh, age. But he was there, right? If something happened, he's all fired up, or he's pacing in the stands. And I would kind of, me and my brother, we'd look up we'd see him nervous and then we'd be nervous, right? And I think it's hard for parents. I always joke around, the kid's fine. The parents are the ones that are stressed, right? And I think yeah. coaches also, right? Like say your goalie lives, gives up a bad goal. You don't even have to say anything, but say you're at the bench, you're kind of, you're hitting the clipboard or your head down, right? You're, you're kind of, that wears off on them. That body language and that stress can really get to them. And then all of a sudden they're looking to the bench kind of for your approval. So the best thing you can kind of stress is just say the line of squeak or just kind of laugh and say, hey, you know what, it's okay. Just reset and move on from there rather than kind of hit your clipboard or kind of shake your head. Um, a way of doing this right is really preaching that reset, like live in the moment, right? I think it's pretty simple theory that if you're thinking about the last goal you let in still or you're thinking about the fact that, oh, I might get pulled, the inevitable, what you're thinking about is probably going to happen right? Where if I think C ball, step to the ball, reset, that's probably what's going to happen. So I th think as coaches, the more that we can stress that to them, it's just going to simplify things and make it easier for them. Uh, another big point that I think, especially at Pee Wee Bantam, I see a lot of this because at Midget, it's a little different. Pee Wee, I know there's kind of an exemption list and all that on equipment and a ton of guys have talked to this about the worst thing you can do as a coach or a parent is say your kid can wear size threes but he's five foot tall you throw him in the size three because you think bigger pads equals more success right and for short term you know what younger shooters he might he might have a little bit of success early but you're also kind of stunting his development because you're throwing him say with a big wall stick before he can't use it and he can't throw or you're throwing in a big size three chest guard and all of a sudden you can't move around anymore. So then as he gets older, his pads will no longer get bigger and he still can't move because he never had to move and he never really could learn how to move because he was kind of drowning in this equipment. And that's one point, right? That's something me personally and I think a lot of guys kind of stress to, to young coaches and parents, right? Don't kind of get caught up in the short term success and risk the long term. 
Marty O'Neill, I know you mentioned Marty O'Neill and he's, he's come up a couple of times and he's a big advocate. He makes it, he does make equipment. Um, and he uh, is a big advocate for not wearing oversized gear, even as an yeah. adult. And I think, I think all the old school guys are right. They kind of yeah. always make fun of us saying, Oh, back in my day, we didn't need all that big equipment. Right. So, yeah. and you know, what, to a certain extent, I think they're right. Like, I think we kind of, we got to get away from that giant, kind of stigma of all oh, they're just big guys and equipment and right and get back to being more athletes and kind of developing them as athletes not just a blocker and that would have to be legislated right because i mean yeah. i know you don't want massive massive gear but you're not going to go out and play in but that's gear but that's you know what the problem is right or... is we kind of uh, even at the NLL level we kind of always joke around that some guys will say oh well he's doing it first or he did it right so two wrongs don't make a right right so yeah. If everyone's bearing, wearing big equipment, obviously most guys are going to wear big equipment, right? If everyone's yeah. cheating in a little way, tons of guys are going to try to cheat in a little way, right? So yeah. whether that's big wood sticks in the summer, all that, like, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I might kind of get in some heat from the goalie union here. I'm not crazy on the wood sticks, right? I think majority of the ones that are in use right now in the summer seasons are like 20 inches wide. They're way oversized, right? So and everybody kind of, they don't, they don't call it because it's the whole theory of you don't want to win on a chintzy call, all that stuff, right? So I think... It totally changes the way that you play as a goalie, right? I mean... 100%, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it forces you to be more of an athlete, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the wood stick. I just think that some of us might need to pull it back a bit and get back to using ones that are the 16 or 15 inside to inside that they're supposed to. As soon as we started talking about this, people started throwing in comments, just listing, you know, old goalies that, that played with the small gear, Moon Wooten, the old Peterborough Timmerman uh, legend, and Dallas Elliott, of course, who everybody knows. Dallas is a huge one, right? And if you look yeah. at him, man, like he was like one third the size of the net when you looked at him, the amount that he saw. But I mean, he was one, probably one of the fastest guys you'll ever see play the position. And He's a pretty good guy. Uh, if you watch him on his YouTube page, he has all the old games updated. So it's definitely cool as a guy at my age, he's kind of a little younger and we never really got to see that old school in a while. And before it even made the switch over to see the way the game was. And I think one thing we kind of joke around about is like how violent the defense was and all of that. Right. And how tough some of these old school guys really were. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going through here. I got a little lost down the wormhole of questions. Yeah, I know. We've been jumping you around a little. So. No, no, it's, Go it's good, right? Yeah. I think um, just building off of kind of the getting kids active and doing different drills. So, I, like, I know it's very hard to put time aside for goalies and minor lacrosse practices, right? And I think there's little things like your warm-up that if, if you set them up early like that, like, say you do snake shooting, you talk to them, right? Get feedback because the sooner you can get them dialed in in practice, the easier it's going to be for them to stay focused when you go into five on fives for the last 30 minutes of practice, stuff like that, right? And you can do different things, change it up, right? If you have two goalies, you can get one to stand at the 24, use them as a screen for players to shoot around. Then your players are getting a benefit from practicing shooting around the screen and your goalies are seeing shots in a different way, right? And I think this is all stuff, the more we like diversify drills, stuff that we can do, rather than just keeping them in that same comfortable situation, it's kind of, it's getting them locked in, it's getting them ready, and it's keeping them from just going through the motions. On a, along that note, uh, Nick Sturris is asking, how do you prepare for the outside bounce shot, whether it's around a goalie as a screen or not? Yeah. Just uh, the shot from the outside coming. So high. the way I always teach it is right as a lot of it's based off your ability to change shoulder height, right? So say a shot's going low, I might drop down, but it's very easy for, as you get older, it's a little better because you can predict it a little better, but we all know coaches preach the bounce shot. They love the bounce shot because it's unpredictable for goalies, right? They, they drop, it goes high, all that stuff. So the one thing I'd say is if you are going to drop, make sure you're practicing keeping your ability to go back up. And I think a common mistake for a lot of kids, especially on the active, the, the way I always kind of look at it, when you're dealing with an active goalie, the problem almost is they're too, too fast. They're moving too fast for their own good, right? And with slow goalies, they kind of, they're, they're sitting there, they're being too much of a blocker. 
So with a young kid, just make sure that he's not just dropping down, right? Say maybe you go your shoulders down and then you still have the ability to bounce back up and track the ball and adjust the bounce rather than selling out for that initial prediction. Yeah, one of the things you know you see so often, and when you're just watching, you see someone wind up for an outside shot, dead overhands, so it's hard to predict where they're going, and you see the goalie drop down a bit, and the ball just drifts yeah. over his shoulder. You're like, what are you doing? Why are you doing yeah, that? But it's because you shots. see the bounce shot coming, right? Yeah, What's that? exactly right. And I think the big thing that we kind of joke around with NLL, a lot of the guys kind of like say you're having a rough game or that. If, if I'm dropping a lot or someone's dropping a lot, we kind of say, oh, he's guessing, right? Like you kind of joke around, right? Because you're kind of, you're, you're trying to cover that five hole so hard. And I think once again, that's kind of just removing that ability and staying focused and in the moment rather than kind of, you get so pressured up that you start guessing. And I think for young goalies, we always want to stay away from that, right? You don't want to, you don't want to just kind of close your eyes and hope for the, hope for the best. I think anything you do, you want to do with 100% confidence. So I think a big guy that I use for this, for example, is Dylan Ward. Like, I don't think when Wardo plays, right, he's very, very level-headed. He's, he's very confident goalie. And I think this is something that I try to put in my game too, Vino, all those guys, is anything you're doing, anytime you're stepping to the ball, step with 100% confidence, right? Don't kind of, uh, I think it's going to go there, right? Or kind of hesitate because hesitation will get you killed, right? It's kind of the, the, the con saying, just – commit to it, trust yourself, and then go from there. Because if you're kind of playing at 75% in and out, it's just, it's pretty simple math that you're not going to be as efficient. We have another question that's uh, saying uh, a, a smaller goalie, 5'5", five, five, playing at the senior level, and asking yeah. how do you recommend making up for lack of height and taking up the most space? They say they're fast, quick, and athletic, like to play a little further back. Rely on, rely on speed. It says, I know I should play out more, but on the flip side, I don't want to be done. Yeah, well, that's, and that's <laughs> and exactly something for a guy like me is a pretty good example, right? Like, I'm not a big frame. I'm probably f like 5'10", maybe 5'11 on a good day, right? But I think the big thing is if you challenge out, just make sure you're being conservative on it, right? Make sure you're not ducking that kind of stuff. I think it's really easy that our initial movement as we step forward towards the ball if anyone, as you lunge forward, you're actually dropping your heights, right? And I think a big thing that I've always kind of th said, if, if I'm going to challenge, I'm going to get out there quick and I'm going to be confident with it, right? Because if they shoot while I'm halfway stepping forward, you're almost kind of stuck on that surfboard there where you lose your ability to step side to side and you're actually just charging forward, which if you look at the trajectory, like every coach in my lacrosse always says, it's about what their head can see, not what they can see, right? So that's where they reach over top. So I'd say just make sure if you are challenging, right, you get out there quick and still retain that ability that say they make that pump fake and take it inside, you can get back to your goal line quick because we all know as a smaller guy that once they're inside, if you're out like that, it's the quick dip dunk and then you're pulling it out of your net. A couple of related questions. The follow-up, the, the second half of that one was, do you have any drills you can work on at home without shooters that people can do? And, and another person was asking, what are the best exercises to do off the floor to keep up with training and improve on your skills? So things to work on positioning and skills and fitness. I think a, a lot of our position, if you look at it, it's, it's footwork driven, right? And I think lacrosse, we're, I, I'm, this is myself included, I think we're way behind the curve on things. If you watch like a hockey goalie, like a hockey goalie can sit there for 30 minutes and do footwork stuff and slides back and forth, right? And it almost, it becomes that art form where they know where they are 24 seven. So I think even if you just have a net, even if you have two cones, right, you set up your five step arc and you start doing some movement stuff. One thing that I've used with young kids to kind of get them moving in different directions, changing without that kind of safety blanket of feeling their post is much like a star drill for players you do the same thing positionally. So say I start on my left post, I step up to the right shooter, then I'm over to the left shooter, then I'm back down to my right post, then up to my point, right? And then you can reset, you can flip which sides, right? And there's all these kind of different formations that you can start building. And then from there you get kind of, it, it's the big thing that I preach on this with a lot of kids is five clean slower sets is better than 
10 sets where you're gassed, but it's a complete mess, right? You're carrying your feet together, making yourself skinny. You're not really getting to the points, right? So what we want to do is kind of build that foundation with, hey, sure, maybe the first ones you talk through it and it's super slow. But when, once you have that foundation, then all of a sudden you can hammer it out and try to set time goals. So say you're going to do 10 star drills, but you want to do it in a minute 30, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that you can use as kind of points to push yourself to be faster. You get more cardio going, but you're still getting the fundamentals down. And then off that, you can do different things like up, down, ups right this is one kind of we had in calgary for a couple of years that i'm sure mike poolin knows about skigs knows about right where he, we would just get gassed right we'd charge out to the far shooter then you'd have to come back you had to drop to your knees then had to get up for the next shooter coming down the alleyway right and that's stuff that you can do without guys just in your equipment right and get moving around especially i think in the time we're living in right now you have that lack of ability to kind of go out and find boxes and find shooters so you can still get in your equipment, get moving around, right? And like I said, there, there's times where, yeah, there's gasser drills, but there's also time for more controlled drills where maybe it is slow, it's not the most entertaining, but you're getting down the fundamentals and it's all stuff that you're going to rely on when, say, it's a third period and you're gassed, that's what you're going to go back to. That's where self-motivation is so important, right? Because especially now you can't be out with your teammates, you can't be out with your coaches necessarily. You've got to find that will. You just go out and just keep doing yeah, like, those drills. For me personally, like I was calling around today trying to find what guys know what boxes are open, right? And I <laughs> think the big thing, right, is we obviously want to handle the situation like in a correct fashion. You don't want to go to the box with 15 guys. But I think at a certain point, we're all kind of we're, we're biting at the chomp here trying to get back to it and kind of get back in equipment. Yeah, we're not going to be playing a season for a while, but I think you kind of feel like you're behind the eight ball. You're not sharpening your craft. and. You just, you kind of almost get that anxiety where, what, what can I do to be better? When you're looking at a, at the shooters or at a, at a shooter, do you, as a goaltender, read the shooter's eyes, body, or stick? If that's what else. So I do a little bit of everything. I'm pretty, like, I, like, once again, I, I, I use a little bit of everything in my game. I'm a little on the unconservative side where, like, I'll kind of, I, I try to mess with shooters every once in a while, say three times I play a certain way the fourth time I'll cheat over to the right side a bit just to, to screw with them. Right. That's not a great tendency to coach, but I think the big thing that I've always found for a lot of guys is most of the time the player's bottom elbow won't lie. So say I'm a righty shooter, wherever my bottom elbow goes is where the ball is going to go. And I think especially as, the game evolves and kind of get to that midget junior age group and guys start throwing twisters, the elbow is going to tell you where it's going, right? It's, you can throw a twister all you want, but essentially if I'm a righty throwing a twister that way, my elbow is going to pull in, right? And as my elbow pulls in, that's what's going to determine the trajectory and angle. So I think that's the only surefire thing that you can use that I think is solid. I've rarely seen guys who can shoot the ball without pulling their elbow to the side that it's going. I think there's certain guys like Tom Schreiber who can fire short side off their hip, but once again, that's a shot that few guys in the world are hitting. Another question is how involved should the goalie be in communication with the defensive players? Oh, it's, and, and that's kind of something I, I kind of think we're going to build towards on the midget side of things. And just right, part of that is having them there to understand the PK, all that stuff, right? Is that you have to have an understanding of the game. You have to know what's going on. And I think goalies sometimes, guys, it's a stressful position and you have to worry about yourself first. But we're, we're behind everything, right? We, we're able to see everything. So say my buddy loses a guy in front of the net, right? And, and he can't see where it is and the guy's behind him. It's my job to communicate to him and help him sort, right? And it's, it's our job to help say that it's strong left, little stuff like that is going to help your defenders. And at the end of the day, we're all on the same team, right? If, if they're playing good D, they're getting to their guys, it's going to equal success for everyone. So as much as you can, get your goalies involved in the game. Start thinking the game as an older guy, right? Don't just watch a bunch of goalie highlights, right? Watch good defense. Like watch guys like Graham Hossick. Watch Kyle Rubish play the low, stuff like that, right? And kind of understand how much foot positioning and where guys are trying to go with the ball and what your defense is doing. 
on that note, I, I would, it would occur to me, like, I guess you want to find a balance when you're coaching kids, whether it's tight up to up through midget and beyond to, to find a balance between focusing on yourself first and then communicating with your offenders, but not getting to the point where you're doing so much, having so much concern about what other people are doing that you don't get your movements right or you're and, not in your position. And, and that's, once again, that's something that you can kind of, you can modify for what, what goal you have, where he is at his game, right? Because you can see a peewee kid at the A level that's at a higher level than, say, a bantam kid at the B level. Or you can see a bantam B kid who has a better understanding of the game than the bantam A kid, right? So it's all different things. And I think especially kids mature at different ages and start understanding the game better at different ages. So we want to encourage them all to be able to do that. But once again, they have to worry about themselves first. So don't kind of over preach it, over stress it. I think a lot of coaches often will do the field thing where they make their kid yell out top right, top left, where the ball's going and understand the value in that to keep them tracking the ball. But it's, it, it's not really doing anything for your defense, right? Most of the guys know where the ball is. So I think I'd rather preach for them to start say pick coming or say, Hey man's b back behind the net or, and stuff like that. Right. That, I think is more of actually a value than volume, right? So maybe they're saying something half, half as much, but what they are saying is more of a value to their defense than just top right, top left, bottom right, right, all that, which it, it gets mind numbing. And then essentially your defenders by the end of it, I think aren't even listening anymore. Yeah. Any questions? Are we good to go on a little bit? Go here? ahead. Yeah, um, so I think we've covered a lot of the midget stuff and I, I don't know how many junior kids we have watching this. And this is kind of an age group that I think personally I find is the most enjoyable to talk to and work with just because they're at that point in their game where a lot of it's self-motivated and it's self them taking themselves to the next step and they're more capable to work on stuff by themselves in practice. And I think a big point that I would say for kids, and this is one Kurt Miloski always kind of said to me, is honest work equals honest result, right? So the more time you're in the net, the better you're going to be, right? It doesn't matter if you're just going to the box with two buddies. I know a lot of us, we don't want to wreck our new equipment and go to the box, right? But the more time you're in the net, it, it's, it's simple math. You're going to have success, right? And I think not only is that work for by yourself, but also as you get older, say you're in a backup position. I think there's a value on, yeah, you know, you're not playing as much, but buy into being a good teammate, buy into being the first guy on the floor, last guy off, right? And I think that's how you're going to get your reps in. That's how you're going to find your success, right? And I think not only are you working on yourself and getting more reps in, but you're helping your team, which as a goalie, like Tyler Richards was a guy that he came in with us. You know, he used to be a pretty top tier goalie and then allow he has championships, all of that. And he's been such an asset for our team, right? He understands the game. He's out there early. He's doing all the little things to not only keep himself sharp, but helping our team succeed in the long run. Um, it's interesting. I think that everyone goes, uh, goes through, the, through the stages um, where they are going to be backups. I mean, you're, I'm sure you were a starter throughout most of your career in minor and, and yeah. junior, obviously, right? And then you come to Calgary as a, an 18-year-old and you're backing up, you know, Mike Poulin and Frank Chiliano and yeah. that. And, third and, strength, uh, right? You've got to get and used to that. I was a third strength that time, right? And I think yeah. as, as, for me, my story is a little different, right? Everybody's kind of on their own path. I was a guy who I think was a victim of too much success, right? Like, I think I almost had it too easy at times. Yeah, you know, I was a rink rat. I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant here, but I'll take credit for I worked my bag off as a kid, right, to get to the positions that I was. But I think you kind of get hit with that little bit of adversity and that pushback. And I think that's a really big point for you to start, A, understanding, you know, how much do I enjoy being in the net and all that stuff and all the stuff that you can often take for granted. I think you, you kind of start to appreciate. And it, it says, you know what, hey, maybe I have to go take reps. Hey, how, how can I get better? And it kind of pushes you to change that result that you're not happy with. But on the flip side of that, so – I went to Calgary, right? My first story there was kind of, I was a third string. Obviously, Mike Poulin moved on to Georgia the next year, and it was kind of me and Frank. Frank ended up being the starting goalie, right? I was back up. We didn't have the greatest year. 
but you know, we are, we're playing and I was playing in that all. Right. So I, I go back to my junior season then. And I think the one thing that we kind of, me and Frank joke around about a lot as a young guy coming into the NLL, it's almost like you don't have any pressure, right? Like you go out there, you're, you're supposed, if, if you fail, that's okay. Cause that's what you're supposed to do. Right. But I think the hardest part that I found for me was going back to my junior game and kind of having that pressure of, Hey, this is supposed to be easy for you. Right. So I'd go out there and I'd have an average game. Right. And people would say, Oh, what's wrong with you? Right. Like, why'd you only have an 83% save percent? Why'd you only like this? Right. And the kind of that outside noise can really get to you. And I think it almost for a bit there, my third year junior, after we had won their first Minto, all that stuff, I think that pressure started to take the fun out of the game for me a bit. Right. And I think you kind of, you get better at people and people you are just kind of going out there doing your best. And people want more and more and more. So I think for me, that was probably my biggest growth year and understanding as a goalie kind of how much pressure can get to you and how much kind of that ability to frankly not really care, right? Just play in the moment, focus at the task at hand can be a huge tool for you. Because if you're stressed, if you're not having fun, like it's hard, right? And I think we all kind of been there in our position where stuff's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. And I think uh, if you look at a guy, a big point that I always use is Vino's the best goalie, in my opinion, personally, and I'm pretty public about it. He's the best goalie in lacrosse history, in my opinion. And he'll get pulled once or twice in an all season, right? So if it's okay for him to have a bad night, I think it's okay for me to have a bad night. And I think it's okay for kids to have a bad night, right? And I think junior coaches, midget coaches, all that, parents especially, like that's something you have to preach. We're all human. We all have mistakes, right? And say something goes wrong, whatever, hit the reset, go back next game and prove them wrong. I think it's interesting, you know, you bring up Matt Vince. One of the things I've always noticed in his career is he will have a bad game. I mean, like you said, everyone does. He almost never has two bad games in a row. Yeah, And that's exactly what you're addressing. If you look at him, right, like he's just, he's done it for so long that it's almost, it's, it's just routine, right? Nothing really gets to him that way. And I think, that's a skill that it's a lot easier once we've developed it. But I think getting over that initial hub where it's almost like you have to understand, Hey, you know what? It's okay. Whatever. Like what's next? Like, and I think it's hard cause you don't want to let people down, but if you're focusing on it, you're never going to get out of that hole of self doubt and all that. I'm curious, you know, you talk about that adversity you face and things. And when you went to the NLL and when Mike Goulin's gone, and then there was one season, Frank Shaliano, you mentioned is starting, but he's suspended for a game. So you get a start and, and it didn't go great for you. I mean, they were I hitting. Got yeah. I got <laughs> hurt, right? They were hitting perfect spots. And Zach Higgins goes in and has a great. Uh, and he played game. great. And, you know, he's a guy who's getting obviously a great look in that all right now. But yeah. I think that was one of those scenarios where you have to have the ability to fall on your face and hit the reset, right? And I think one guy who I think a year later kind of was going into one of my first starts since I took over the starting job in Calgary, Dan Doby kind of pulled me aside and he said, hey, listen, man, the reason why you've had success in junior and all that is you're, you didn't get rattled. You didn't care, right? You just play in the moment. So it's kind of just finding that ability that, you know what? Yeah, that sucked. And you know what? That was really hard. It was the home opener. You let all the guys down and you're kind of, you get that feeling of like, man, maybe I'm not supposed to be here, right? So I think that's something that's normal that we all go through. And it's kind of just to me, it's important to talk about it rather than just kind of like anything else where you can kind of just sit there and think and think and think rather than just getting back on the horse and saying, hey, you know what? Own it. That was my bad and move forward. And it worked out okay for you. We have a question from Robin, you know, who asked, please don't laugh because uh, Robin's still new to this, but what do you mean when you say the box? We we're talking, you're talking about your, what do you mean when you say the box? You're talking about finding a box that's open to go and work in. Oh, the, like in, in Vancouver, Coquitlam, especially in my area, we're in, in Canada, we're pretty fortunate. We have uh, outdoor rinks just about everywhere. We've, I think we have like four or five in my hometown, but at the moment they have the nets locked together because of all the self-isolation stuff. So I think we're kind of all itch and find other ways to get involved and get playing again. We have a, an outdoor box in Peterborough. It's been around for decades, but uh, there are no nets. They're only hockey nets. Yeah. So uh, I actually helped coach the Peterborough senior lady, lady Lakers yeah. for a while. And uh, PJ Johnston was the head coach and he would bring nets 
for yeah. practices that we held then. Well, Coquitlam, well, uh, we have Smith boxes. Our kind of that's our Holy Grail spot. That kind of all the older guys in the last couple generations. It's been around forever, so yeah. it's definitely fun. And as a kid, right, that's where we spent like seventy five percent of our time. My dad would take me there, soup me up. I'd have junior guys that were nice enough to shoot on me, right, and take it easy on me, and kind of <laughs> build that confidence and have those fond memories, right, of kind of going out there. Nothing really mattered. You're just playing backyard lacrosse, right? We have one other question. Uh, going to a Calgary situation. Who is faster on the outlet, Shane Simpson or Zach Courier? Ooh, you know what? Courier is shifty, and he's one of the best loose ball guys in the world. That's undoubtable. But I have never seen somebody that can run like Shane Simpson. Shane Simpson's the only guy that I've ever said, heard say to me, throw the ball faster. Like he just <laughs> he doesn't want it lofted. He doesn't want it right. He wants it in his stick as quick as he can. Because it doesn't matter if you throw it somewhere, he's going to be able to run faster than you can throw it. it. It's pretty special. He's one of those guys, it seems like he's like NFL fast. So I'd say he's, I'd have to go simmer. I, I hope Curry doesn't hear this because he might get a little upset. But to be oh, true, he's going to hear it because I'm going to tell him. I think Dane Doby is the one who thinks he's the fastest out of the gates. So that's all that matters. Well, he is because he's coming in from two-thirds of the way down the slingshot. floor. Slingshot. <laughs> it's a slingshot. He gets out of the bench. He's flying. It's funny because Dane Dolby will say, you know, I'm not really an athlete. I'm not fast. I'm not this. But I'll tell you, and he, he may not be the, yeah, he might not be the fastest guy, but when he sees a lane to the net, he's not the slowest. He always gets there. It's a part of his thing. He, you know, he goes out there, he's unassuming, and guys don't really think much of him. But you know what? He's strong. He's got a low center of gravity, and that first step's pretty quick for an old guy. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to wrap up unless uh, do you have some other a couple other things you want to get to Chris we are slightly no, no, over I, I think I'm pretty good like I said just if anyone has any more questions feel free to reach out on social media stuff like that right I might not respond right away but especially with younger guys all that I always try to reach out don't be afraid you're not you're not hassling me right just obviously don't take offense if the response isn't right away and to wrap it up uh, a, a comment from another another goalie of legend rad joseph who said what a fabulous session clearly christian is a brilliant young man super informative down-to-earth hardcore advice which uh, i would have to agree with uh, i know everyone's always been very impressed with you christian uh, i remember back to the you know when there was some stuff going on at the minto cup that was you know a lot of stuff was up in the air and nobody knew what was going on and there's a lot of controversy and one of the lasting images is you going out and letting kids shoot on you and you know wow. that's that's one thing that i'd say it's it's kind of the pay it forward right I remember I was a kid that was a ball boy growing up and stuff like that and how much those little memories and little stuff like that, that, you know, it's, it's 15 minutes of my time, but that's a memory that might last a lifetime or might create somebody becoming a fan of the game or involved in the game and kind of those lasting impressions that we were able to make as senior A guys, junior guys, NLL guys. It's kind of just those who can should, right? I know I always appreciate getting a chance to chat with you. I know everyone else. Really appreciate you coming on. So thanks, Christian. And thank you. We're just going to say a quick thank you to our sponsors yeah. who helped to make this uh, this tournament possible. And uh, they include Major Series Lacrosse, Apex Lacrosse Events, uh, Bear Paw Lacrosse Events, um, Manitoba Lacrosse, Sticks and Picks Podcast, Uncommon Fit, and The Par Team. So uh, thanks to all of them. And once again, thanks for everyone, to everyone for showing up. And Christian, thank you. And uh, Thank you, everyone, for coming in to listen, right? And I think, obviously, thank you for everyone who helped made this possible. All right, we'll wrap it up there. we got lots more coming. Another couple of sessions today, and then back to it on Tuesday.